You've asked me about translations of the Bible. I told you probably one of the most accurate translations that I've ever seen is the Sacred Name Bible. I told you it was printed on newspaper almost. There it is. It's really poor printing quality paper. Uh, it, uh, I have it upside down. Here it is. And uh, it's the restoration of the original Sacred Name Bible. That's what it's called. If you want to look at this, take it, uh, take the thing down later on. Uh, I'm going to bring it for a couple of different classes. Uh, I'm going to read. We, we talked about some different verses. Are you familiar with Hebrew also, Christo? Not too much. Not much. Not, not. All right. Uh, I teach Greek and Hebrew at the same time. We're in the book of Ephesians, but there's so many Hebraisms that you have to bring it into Greek or else you won't understand what Paul's saying. All right? And uh, we've studied a lot. We're going to start studying on Sunday morning the Bible in Eight Ages by L.D. Foreman, which was actually written originally by J. Lewis Guthrie. Uh, Guthrie was a tremendous Greek and Hebrew scholar. Um, and I've had a lot of questions to this, so I'm bringing it over in a little bit of this class. I usually spend almost all of it on Greek, but tonight we got, I'm going to give you a little information because you've asked me so many questions about translations. In uh, this book, all right, now, it's modern seed of Ara, Elohim, et Hashemayim, we have Aris, okay, in Genesis 1 and 1, in beginnings, created God, Elohim, the heavens, Hashemayim, and the earth, we have, we have Aris. And then it says, and the earth, she became formless and void, all right? And the earth, Aris. Uh, Hatya, Tohu Vahuhu, okay? In earth she became formless and void. Something happened from Genesis 1 and 1 to Genesis 1 and 2. I said that. Now this one translates in beginning. Now it should be in beginnings because it's talking about in one of the beginnings, God created the heavens and the earth. Now heavens is plural. In King James is singular. It should be plural. Uh, beginnings should be plural. But now it says, now the earth had become waste and wild, and darkness was upon the face of the roaring deep, but the spirit of Elohim was brooding on the face of the waters. Now all of that should be plural, what it should say, now the earth she had become formless and void, and darkness became over the faces of the waters, and spirit God, spirit Elohim, it doesn't say it does spirit, but it says spirit Elohim. So it's not exactly like Hebrew, but it's this is probably the best translation that I've ever seen of it. What okay. does the word the in Hebrew denote? It does it uh, ha. Ha? Yeah. Hashinayim, the heavens, ha aritz, the earth, aritz is earth, ha is the you know enough about Hebrew to know that, don't you? <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, uh, one of the most beautiful places that it translates correctly, and I've never seen it in any other translation, is Psalm 16 and verse 10. Uh, Psalm 16 and verse 10, uh, where it translates, For thou will not abandon my soul in Hades, neither thou will suffer. And what does it say in King James? Psalm 16, 10. Or New American Standard, somebody turned there also. This is the only correct translation of this that I've ever seen. And it translates it correctly in this Bible. Psalm 16 and 10? Uh-huh. <clears throat> it gave upon me with the mouth. Psalm oh, 16 I and 10. Jumped in the door, so yeah. have it. I have it here in the uh, okay, New American Standard. Uh -huh. For thou wilt not abandon my soul to shale, neither wilt thou allow thy holy one to undergo decay. All right, the whole thing talking about, that's talking about the New, that's New American Standard. It's talking about the Messiah. It's talking about Jesus. How does, it, how does yours translate it? Uh, what do you have? I have King James. Okay. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. All right. What it literally says in Hebrew is thy man of loving kindness, the merciful one, is what it says. And, of course, the merciful one is when Jehovah became flesh. He he took he was our servant he was our <clears throat> savior and our substitute. Uh, there are several other places. Revelation one and eight is something in the New Testament where it where it quotes the Hebrew. Many times it uses the the Hebrew uh, words. 
and this is one place it does. It doesn't do it as well as I think it should. <laughs> I, uh, I looked at it, and I told my wife, I said, you know something? I wrote the only perfect New Testament <laughs> place I don't see. <laughs> <laughs> and I really humbly say that for true. <laughs> But, uh, and they did, they may print it one of these days. I don't know. I gave it to the American Baptist Association. They're supposed to print it. I don't know if they ever will or not. It goes so contrary to King James that they probably won't. But anyway, I did it. Revelation 1 and 8. I am the Alpha, or the A and the Z, says Jehovah, the Elohim. Now, who is Jesus? He is Jehovah. Isn't he? All right. Now, who is, who was, Actually, it said, who became, and it is to come, all right? The Almighty, all right? Now, we know that Jesus is the Almighty God. He is He is Jehovah. He is Elohim. That's just some of the things and some of the places it translates them. And I told you, if you wanted to study extra study, Eric Sauer. Eric Sauer wrote about four or five books. Every one of them are absolute dynamite. You will be amazed and thrilled with the study of Eric Sauer. This is from eternity to eternity. And uh, God's eternal purpose, I'm going to get some of this written by one of my teachers. One of my teachers wrote this, Alan Atkins, Dr. Alan Atkins. This is another good one. And then I talked about Genesis 1 and 1, 1 and 2, and this is G.H. Kimber. Uh, he wrote this in 1876. He was quite a scholar. He was somewhat contemporary with a man that wrote this companion Bible. All right? And this companion Bible, how many of you have heard of Dr. Gene Stump? <coughs> you have? Anyone else? Dr. Gene Stump? He was a, a uh, well, John Shirley thinks he's the cat's meow as far as that goes. He, he went to uh, Stanford University and challenged the doctorate program and got it. <laughs> All right, that's a pretty smart man. He was a pretty smart man. Well, several of my students were. Uh, really students of Gene Scott. Gene Scott, almost all his preaching was based upon this man right here that wrote this. This man was so humble, he wouldn't even let him put his name in the Bible. They called it the Companion Bible. Is it pretty accurate? Uh, it's, it, well, it's from King James is what it is. Oh, yeah. It's King James, but the commentary on it is absolutely fantastic. All right? Everything that I've taught you in Hebrew is right down here in all the footnotes. Here's King James, and there's all the footnotes. Okay? <laughs> all right? I'll see if I can read this to you. Just what we... And the earth was, was formless and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, let's see what he says about this. Notice. And then he goes on. He, he, uh, by the way, he wrote many books. Uh, Pulitzer did. Can I ask a question verses? Okay, the, it says, uh, uh, see it, separate other things that he's emphasized here. And the important word, God, is carried like was become. All right? He said that was is not was, but become here. And see Genesis, and then he's got a long line of other things. Also, Brenner came to pass, Genesis 4 and so on. He gives a long line of them. And... Uh, then he goes on down here and tells all the different places what happened between Genesis 1 and 1 and Genesis 1 and 2. It's all down in here in his commentary. This is a companion Bible. Does he agree with the Gretry? Yes, he does. They were all contemporaries of that time, in, basically. In L.D. Foreman's book, The Bible in Eight Ages, yes. he quotes Genesis 1 and 1 and he, he uses in beginning. In, it should be in beginnings. Why? What is, why does he translate it one way and, and another? He wasn't emphasizing that point that okay. in that place, that's all. He, was, he wasn't emphasizing. When I translate, I just translate it exactly what it says to you. Because I think it's very important. So, so, every so, word is important. So the fact that it's plural is very important. In one of the beginnings, in one of the beginnings, you know, in one of the beginnings, God created angels. There was a beginning when God created angels and all spirits. Okay, in another beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. All right? And then in another beginning, after the heavens and the earth had become formless and void and waste and destroyed and, and so on and so forth, as it says in Genesis 1 and 2, then he restored the heavens and the earth. 
the light came on with those. With that. Just with all that, huh? Yeah. The, does the Septuagint, <laughs> does it pick up on all those those fine details? The Septuagint the is really a very poor translation mm -hmm. of the Hebrew. And I've heard a lot of people say all kinds of things about the Septuagint. I have read the Septuagint. Uh, most ministers don't even read the Septuagint, but I read the Septuagint. I go back and check everything out, and I find out. Because Jesus, when he was teaching, he spoke Greek. He spoke Greek, and he's quoted the Septuagint. I know that because he quoted the Septuagint and not the Hebrew Bible, because it is different. When he quoted Hebrew, it quoted Hebrew in the Greek text. It'll say Hebrew. A made arise, all of this, he would use the different, it quotes the different things that he said. When he was speaking in some language other than Greek, it quoted the Greek. All right? It made a, uh, it just transferred it over into Greek, what it said in the language. He quoted Psalm 42 and verse 1 on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All right? So the Septuagint in the Greek is accurate, but not in the Hebrew? The Septuagint is not accurate. Is not accurate. It was not an accurate translation of the Greek, because I know Hebrew and I know Greek, and I can tell you that. It just is. Most people just say whatever, but I can tell you, I can go and show you a dozen mistakes in 15 minutes uh, that they made, and one of them was in Genesis 1 and 1, Genesis 1 and 2. So the Nessel Allen text is... Well, no, Nessel Allen now, that's the, that is the Greek text of the New Testament. Right. The Septuagint is a Hebrew... Uh, Old Testament translated into Greek. Yeah, I, I understand, yeah. but the, the Nestle Allen in Greek, that, that is fairly accurate. That is as accurate as the autographs of the that, of Paul and Peter and whoever wrote. G.H. Uh, Pember says, We see then that God created the heavens and the earth. He, used it, he translates it correctly. Perfect and beautiful in their beginning, and that at some subsequent period, how remote we cannot tell, that the earth had passed into the state of utter dissolution and was void of life, not merely had its fruitful places become wilderness and all of its cities been broken down, but the very light of its sun had been withdrawn, and all the moisture of its atmosphere had sunk upon its surface, and the vast deep to which God had set its bounds and that are never transgressed, save then wrath has gone forth from him and burst those limits, so that the ruined planet covered above its very mountaintops with the black floods of destruction was rolling through space in a horror of great darkness. That's what the age member says about Genesis 1 and 1, Genesis 1 and 2. Well, these all is there, were great scholars, and they knew the languages. Now, is there any time value, has there ever t any time value been placed on that period of time? Between Genesis 1 and Genesis We have no idea how many years or how much time there was between those times. No, there's, we just don't know. God doesn't say it. He's in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, he tells us what happened during those times. It's really, it's really not relative to our... No, well, it doesn't make any difference. We know that in the beginnings, God created heavens and the earth. He did not create anything imperfect. God is perfect and he makes perfect creation. Okay, something had become happened to the earth, and every time you put, see the word was translated in, in Genesis one, all right, but became there or had become, and you will understand it much better. All right, now, yes, brother Bill. I know that it, it, uh, <clears throat> God created the earth, King, and everything He created was perfect, mm -hmm. but He did create imperfection. Not when He created the devil. That, the devil was created perfect. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. He created him perfect, but he created with him with personal volition. And that personal volition. Or that would be imperfect. No. No. It wasn't perfect. Man was created perfect. Woman was taken from man. Okay? They were perfect. But they became imperfect because they had a volition. And that volition. From their desires of their own hearts, they became imperfect. And, and they again, became, Satan, Satan was created perfect. Yes, he was. He became imperfect because God gave him a freedom of will. Of will of he, he became imperfect because he wanted to, to rebel against God. He said he was the most perfect creation of God. He was beautiful. The devil is not ugly. Lucifer is not ugly. He is beautiful. But he had a volition that was very dangerous. God could not get glory from anything in this world that was ever created unless it had a will. 
God created man in his image, didn't he? What is the most, one of the most important things about God? The Calvinists always follow about it. What is it? The sovereignty of God. Sovereignty means you do what you want to. What you, and also, when he created man, he created man that's sovereign. Man. Also. He was sovereign also. He did what he wanted to, good or bad. But without such sovereignty in mankind, created in the image of God, he would not be able to glorify God because he would be a robot instead. Brother John. Thank you. I got another one for you, too. Uh, Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. The word in Ephesus was not there in the original language. It was a circular letter. It became known as the Ephesian letter much later. Okay? Hi. Okay. All right, Tus. And Ini. Somati. To. Diu. Dia. Tu. Suru. Apokatenes. Pain. Ekthron. And Altu. That's kind of like off to today, isn't it? <laughs> out to back then. Greek has changed in its in its uh, pronunciation. Uh, there's basically four stages, well, five stages in the Greek language. It was the dialects originally. The dialects uh, evolved into classical Greek. Classical Greek became Koine Greek. What does Koine mean? Common. Common. It was the universal language of the whole world because Alexander the Great took it to all of the nations. He wanted to unify all nations, and he wanted them to have one language, and that's why the Greek, the Hebrew was translated into Greek. <clears throat> all right, it became the Septuagint. The, the, the Jews, I don't care what they say, they will say they were speaking Hebrew and Aramaic back in that day, but they were not. And I'll tell you one way to prove it, one simple way. What do they call their synagogues? What are they called? Synagogues. Synagogues. That is a Greek word. When it was created, it was a Greek word, synagogue. That's what it was. All right? If they would have used Hebrew, if they'd been speaking Hebrew, it would have been Moed. Not Moed. It's synagogue. All right? Simple as that. That ought to prove it. <laughs> as simple as that. All right. And we have a little conjunction there. And Kai. Now, Kai can be translated different things. Sometimes it's strong. Adversive conjunction sometimes is a, uh, a a particle of affirmation. Right here, it's just plain and conjunction. All right, and then we have apokata la se, third person singular, first aorist, subjunctive active. Let's look at all of that. Third person singular. Who is that? That's he. That he did it, didn't he? He. Third person singular. He. And then we have first aris, aris tense. What's that first aris mean? You remember what first aris mean? Point action. Punctiliar action. That's what it means. First aris and second aris. What's the difference between first aris and second aris? Huh? First and second aris. First aris is that, second aris is this. <laughs> just a little bit more durative linear action, but it's punctiliar. All right, but it just adds a little more time. Is that how you like that, bro? <laughs> All right. He he might down loose. He might reconcile. Subjunctive mode. Mode. How is the verb affirmed in the subjunctive mode? All right. Every time that we see the volition of mankind, we see God creating man in His sovereign image, we see the ability of mankind to either go the right way or the wrong way. And that is this little heiress, or not heiress, but subjunctive mode right here. It may or may not. Subjunctive mode is a mode of doubtful affirmation. It can or it may or may not happen. What is a very, there's another mode, isn't there? That other mode is a mode of hopeful affirmation. It's not here. But what mode is that? I'll tell you. That's a rare one. In the New Testament. I'll take it both. All right. Active voice. Simply, he's doing the acting. All right. That he might reconcile. All right. 
that God might reconcile. What's he trying to reconcile here? Jew and Gentile. All right, Jew and Gentile. Now, he's going to destroy the uh, barrier of uh, prejudice. What's prejudice? Hate for another race. Yeah, active enmity. All right, from one race to the other. In Jesus Christ, Jesus totally destroyed all active hatred between nations. Because all nations have one access to God now. We don't have to go to the Jew to find God. All right? We don't have to go to a Jew to find God anymore. We can go right straight to God by the way of Jesus Christ. And that he might destroy, that he might reconcile. Tus, that's a Tuesday plural, definite article in it. The ones. We can put ones there, the ones. It is tus, but it has the idea, or practical idea, of somebody. And the somebody is plural. All right? Accused in plural, definite article here, with a little practical substantive, the ones. And then for omphoterus, little adjective describing something. Both. Omphoterus, both. In, now we have a little preposition, in. Our English word in comes right straight out of Greek. And then we have hini. What is that word hini? It's an in, like with an I, yellow on the end of it, isn't it? But it's got a rough breather on it, doesn't it? All right. <clears throat> what is that? That's a numeral in there. All right. Both in one. Somatic. Somatic. Soma. That's where it comes from. That's body. All right? Body. He might destroy all the prejudice, all the walls, all the barriers between men, between Israel and the Gent from between the Jew and the Gentile in one body. And then two theu. Dative singular masculine two. Theu. Theu comes from what? Theos. How many cases are there in Koine Greek? Huh? Eight cases. Nominative, genitive, optative, blocking, instrumental, dative, accusing, and blocking. Eight cases. All right? This is what we call the dative case here. All right? It's also called the lid cases. Locative, instrumental, or dative. They have the same endings. See that omega with an iota subscript underneath it. All right? To the God. He might reconcile. He might destroy. He might... Down loose the ones both in the one body to the God. Mankind now has one access to God. Dia. Dia can be translated by the agency of or through. All right? By the agency of or through. A little preposition. Through to staru. Staru. What does this staru mean? Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you this is a stake. The stake. How, what does the star room mean? You know, brother? Cross. All right? But it originally meant stake. It originally meant stake. Just like this, stake. It goes back in history. Who invented the crucifixion? No. Who? Assyrian. Assyrians. The Ninevites. God had a plan for Nineveh. He sent them a special prophet. Who was it? Jonah. 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 All right. Sent a special prophet to, to Nineveh. And that prophet was supposed to go to Nineveh, and that prophet did not want to go to Nineveh. Why didn't that prophet want to go to Nineveh? Because he didn't want he to go to Nineveh. Now, wait a minute. Uh, he, was, he was not, a, uh, he was not in the in the tribe, or the, what we call Judah, but he was in Israel. He was in the ten tribes of Israel. That's where he, he, he came from, okay? <coughs> now, God had prophesied against Israel that he was going to hiss and bring the Assyrians in to chastise them and to carry them off into captivity. And these Assyrians were rough dudes. Oh, I mean, they were bad guys. 
They would take people out on the side of the road when they went and conquered an area, and they would take them, and they would grease this pole and set them right on top of there and let it go up through their body slowly and impale them. They called it staking somebody. This was the beginning of crucifixion. They would impale them. They'd set them off, and slowly that stake would go up into their innards and, and rupture their innards, and finally they would die. Slowly and painful death, and a very humiliating death. All along the road you would see this why Jonah didn't want to have anything to do with these people, because he knew of the prophecies. He knew what was going to happen. And he sure, what was he supposed to do? What was his message? He's supposed to have repent. Huh? Uh, repent. Did he want them to repent? No. When Jonah preached to that city, you know, he got he got a whale ride, didn't he? A whale of a ride. <laughs> he did, he got a whale of a ride. He went out there and he, he was supposed to go one way and he went another way and he got out on the boat. And God sent a great storm against his boat. And they were saying, what in the world's going on? The people have always been superstitious, especially superstitious back then. And as soon as this terrible storm came up, they started praying to their gods. They had plenty of them. Jonah was supposed to be serving one god, Jehovah. All right. What does Jehovah mean? He who shall become the one, the becoming one. We know who that one. Well, Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was basically the capital of Assyria, the great city. That's where the king lived, huh? All right. And he wanted to go the other way. He didn't want to take any part in protecting an enemy that was going to destroy his people because he was prejudiced. If you don't think he was prejudiced, read the book of Jonah. After God saved him, he was mad in the heart. Well, God uh, <clears throat> brought judgment upon them, and they went down there and looked at Jonah, and Jonah was sniveling down there, running from God, and they said, what's going on? He says, my fault. Throw me overboard. Well, he'd rather die at that moment than go and preach to Nineveh. Throw me overboard. They throw him overboard, and a great fish swallowed him. And what did he do? Where did Jonah go? He went to hell. <laughs> he went to Hades. He was in Hades. The place of the Spartans. Hades, the place unseen in Greek. Not visible. That's what Hades means. The place not seen. He went to Hades and he lifted his voice up and cried to God and repented. Now you're not going to have a second chance in hell, by the way. But this man was a prophet of God and he was going on this mission and he's God stopped this mission that he was going the wrong way on and used a whale or a fish for transportation, whatever it was. We don't know what kind of a fish it was, this said great fish. And he swallowed the man and he died. A lot of people say, Well, he lived in the whole bale of well for three days. Jesus said, I'll be like Jonah in the belly of a whale. Jesus, if Jesus was like Jonah, guess what? Would, did Jesus die on the cross of Calvary or did he not? He did. All right, so he's going to be, Jonah was a type of Jesus. So Jonah was dead in the whale's belly, simple to say. Well, the whale started going the right direction. The ship was going wrong, but the whale was going the right direction. He got there and he spit him out. God resurrected that man out of the place of departed spirits and put him on the land. He went in there and then he preached. And he didn't preach with uh, mercy. He preached with judgment. I'm, God's going to kill every one of you dirty rats. Got so many days to repent or you're dead ducks. And he was hoping they wouldn't repent. But guess what they did? They repented. Every one of them. They even dressed their animals in sackcloth <laughs> and their dogs and puppies. You know, every one of them was dressed in sackcloth and ashes, repenting and crying to God for mercy. And God saved every one of them. And Jonah was mad. Because he didn't want them to be saved. That's where the word sorrow came from right there. was from this type of period of time. And it was saved. But later on, the Romans much improved the suffering of this type of death. And it was called crucifixion. 
And what they did is they nailed somebody to it. Instead of pushing this up through their body, they nailed somebody up there. You see, what they wanted to do was cause death to be very slow. So they nail a nail through their carpal tunnel, by the way. It wasn't in their hands, but through here. The word "ketter" in Greek means from here to here, doesn't it? All right? The whole arm. So they put it through the carpal tunnel here and nailed him to the cross. They put him down here. They put a sand right here. They even put a place where he's butt to set on so he could rest. So he'd last a little bit longer and sit there and suffer. Suffer and suffer. Dying for days. I think one guy was on the cross for three weeks before he died. History. Nailed his feet down here, and he would be hanging there like this, pushing himself up to get a breath of air until he finally totally exhausted and suffocated. That was the staros, staros, the, the death of the cross, the death of the stake. But he was stake originally, but then as he came cross, when the Romans perfected this form of. Jim is, is the Greek, is the cross. In Greek, anywhere in this word here means stake. Yes, which meant cross it, meant, it had changed. The, the name, the, the word had evolved. You know, all from the stake to the New cross. Testament, you have where it says the, uh, cross. Uh -huh. any of them? Well, they weren't impaling them on it anymore, were they? They didn't strip them off and stick the thing up and you know and let them go down on it. They had nailed them to the cross. See the, the form of crucifixion. Or, uh, this was impaling, but it became crucifixion, but the same word, because the Greeks used that word, the Syrian idea of the stake, and then it just evolved to mean what it was. All right. So the word stero, So the staros means the cross. Means the cross. Okay, it does mean the cross. It means the cross of the crucifixion the cross, because in Jesus' time, the word had evolved to mean crucifixion cross. Okay. Same word. They didn't change the word, but it meant that. Now that's something you need to get because Joe Wood is going to say it's stake and not cross. Baloney. Is there a, they don't know about the history of the word. Is there a word. Greek word that says cross? Or Star Star cross. <laughs> that's it. That's that's the word. <laughs> but it evolved into this. Now that word in, in uh, Greek at that time in a different context could just mean a stake in the ground as well? But in this, this was I, the cross. I understand. Yeah. But it... it Probably could be translated stake, but it was cross. That's what it really meant here. The All right. used here. By the cross. So you translate this not stake, but cross. It was the old word that evolved into the word that means cross. All right. And we have the idea and understanding of that why Jonah didn't want to go now, don't you? But God had a plan. All right. And then, then it says, Apo This uh, word. Is from Apple and Katano. And this means to completely destroy, to slay. It has a, a preposition on the front of Apple, and that intensifies the word. Right? It, intens it makes it stronger. You could put down Katanos, and it would mean to destroy. But Apple Katanos means to totally destroy, to, di dis to disassemble. All right? To. Uh, Completely slay, killed off, it says, Tain Ekthron. This is that active hatred here. Ekthron, the active hatred. The force, the hatred, the uh, racism. Active hatred, the racism, the prejudice in him, in Christ. I wrote something down here. All enmity between Israel and any other nation has been destroyed now through the cross, but only sin separates them now. Sin causes this hatred between nations now. Bad religion, corrupt religion, Protestant, Catholic, cults, isms, puts them on their high horses of pride and prejudice one against the other. But Jesus destroyed that prejudice through the cross. All right, number 17. Hi, El Thon. You egg elisato. You egg elisato. Erene, 
Amen. Kois. Makron. Kai. Arainen. Tois. Igis. And having come. Now here we have a participle. Participle means what? Something continuing. All right, something continuing on. And now we have the second heiress. All right, here's the second heiress. We saw the first heiress. Now the participle is a marriage, a union between a verb and a noun. Okay, the verb and the noun. And this verb and noun come together. We call this in English gerunds. Something with an E on the end of it, all right? But how would we translate this? And having come. Comes from Erechimai, by the way. I'll fold the second heiress, participle, active, nominee, singular, masculine. And having come, all right? Having come what? When Christ come into this world. See that? Directive linear second heiress in there. There was a time he was born of the Virgin Mary. He came into the world. He spent his 33 years, of, uh, 33 and a half years upon this earth. That's the second heiress idea here. And also the participle. Every bit of the action of this verb noun is shown forth in the life of Jesus Christ, his earthly ministry on this earth. Having come, and then we have the word here, Yog. Elista, Sato. I haven't got it printed so poorly here, I can hardly read it. This comes from Angelos, or Angelizo. And you on the front of it. You is a little uh, prefix. And that means good. Good. And then Angelos is what? Or Angelisa. Angelos. By the way, we have two gammas here. Alpha, gamma, gamma, okay? Alpha, gamma, gamma. When it has two gammas, what, what happens? The, the, the sound changes, doesn't it? A and G is what it sounds like. We get our word from Angelos, we got our word angel. Okay? It means messenger. And Angelizo means the message. So we have you Angelizo, basically. Now, it's third person singular, first heiress, indicative, middle voice. All right, third person singular, he, first heiress, punctiliar action, he did something, he preached, all right, good message, they're preached, and then middle voice, what in the world does that mean? Who caused Jesus to do this? What caused it? He did it for himself. The word Jehovah, he who shall become, all right, God became flesh, John 1 and 1, in the beginning, kept on being the Word. The word, Word, there was not a Greek idiom, but a Hebrew idiom. They referred to the idea in the Hebrew Bible, when they came to the word Jehovah, they referred to him as the Word because they, he, the name was too holy to speak, and they didn't know how to speak it, by the way. In beginning, singular, by the way, in beginning, the absolute extremity of all eternity kept on being the Jehovah. And Jehovah kept on being an inseparable part of the Godhead, the second part of John 1 1, because he was God. He kept on being God. John 1 14. Kai Pologo Sarksaganito. And the word flesh, he became, fulfilling the Jehovah title, Jehovah, he who shall become. The word flesh became. Jehovah became flesh and dwelt among us. That's how he did this. And how did he do it? John 1.18 says, it comes from the word in the last part of that. Someone turn to John 1.18 and read that for me, please. Here we are. We're explaining this verse. The idea of it, the grammar of it, everything. I believe that the Bible is totally, absolutely inspired of God in the original languages, even the modes and voices and tenses of the verbs. All right, John 1, uh, Brother Dave. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath uh, declared him. 
All right, Brother Harold, read that to me from King or from New American Standard. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God. That's right. That's better translation. That's correct. Who the is? only begotten God. That's the only per. That's the only time God ever came into the human flesh. The only begotten God. Go ahead. Who is in the bosom of the Father? He has explained him. All right. The word "explained him" there comes from Ek and Hago. What does Ek mean? Uh, out of. What does Hago mean? I lead. I bring. I go. That's I have a footnote here. It says, "Let himself out." That's right. Let himself. Does it say that in? in I have it written. Oh, you read it. <laughs> All right. He has <laughs> let himself out. Middle voice, by the way. Middle voice. All right, he laid himself out. All right. Having come, he preached for himself because he laid himself out of eternity in the space and time in the flesh of Jesus Christ. Okay? And then it says, Arini, Shalom. Page 575, you want to look that up in the moment of your lexicon. You'll see what the word Arini and Shalom means. <clears throat> Absolute tranquility, peace, freedom from uh, freedom from any guilt. Total tranquility. Complete lack of fear. No division of the mind. Soundness. Tranquility. That's what that word is. And he preached peace to you. All right, to you. Amen. Native plural, second person from Tois Macron. All right. Tois. To the ones, native plural, definite article. Ones, practical substantive. Okay. To the ones, Macron. What does Macron mean? <coughs> Us? Mach. What is it? Macro. We got a word in English. Macro, yeah, that's huge, large. Yeah. All right, huge, large. Also far away. Uh, far away. All right. Far away. All why is, right. Why is that capitalized there? Well, it's a, it's a, again, it's a, it's a quotation. It's a quotation from the Old Testament. All right. To the ones far away. Who is that? Who's that? Who's the ones far away? Who is the furthest away from the altar of God? Us Gentiles. Hmm. All right. Far off and Kai Arene and peace to the ones twice Egis. How do you say that in modern Christmas? Uh, uh, Eastern Greek. Eastern Greek. Oh, it's it's Eastern Greek. Egis. Egis. In Eastern Greek, I, it was studied you know, 15 years ago. It was in high schools. Uh -huh. high schools. Mm -hmm. They don't teach anymore. They're okay. And I remember I was in the third grade high school. In the last three months, I still read it. Mm -hmm. Well, but I told you. Greek now, we were in our kitchen here. Mm -hmm. Like, if they go in Greece now, uh -huh. nobody will understand it. No, no, they wouldn't. I, I, I taught. Don't know the answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I taught uh, the Greeks over the years, and I sat down with, with Ted and with yeah. George, with Fulke, and I'll explain to them their languages yes. and the history of the. Ted is educated. He was taught in New York. Yeah, oh, yeah. He's at the school. Well, yeah. Fulke was, he, he went to the seminary to become a priest. And he knows his koine in classical. This is so he's the only one. He's the only one I could ever speak Greek to. That was the only Greek language. It was just, the ancient Greek was real. Yeah. Nobody was Greek to speak. Greek. All I, well, see, I started to say a while ago there was there was the dialects, mm -hmm. there was classical, there was koine, and then Byzantine, and then modern Greek. That's the evolution of the Greek language. And I tell you that in the in the beginning of that, the Greek grammar, the history of the Greek language in there, you'll see all of that. So the ones near, Egis, all right, Egis, near, close by. 218, 218, okay, okay. D, mm -hmm. now why isn't that Dia? It's the, it's the word Dia, all right, why isn't it D? Because it's followed with a vowel, out tone, and not only a vowel, but a diphthong, and so for euphony, for good sound, that comes right straight from Greek language, we drop the alpha, and we just put it there, and we put D, altu, mm -hmm. echomen, pain, prosocogain, hoi, ampoteri, 
Ann, Eni, Numati, Ros, Tol, Patera. All right. <coughs> Hoti, little conjunction. It means because of. Because of. By the agency of the, because of, or through, or because of, by the agency of, by the power of something. Him, of him, genitive. By the way, what's a genitive case mean? What's that genitive case mean? That's a case of possession. A case of possession, he owns it. Because of him. Because who does Jesus, what does God own? Everything. All right? Jesus sent his disciples when he was going, going to ride into Jerusalem. This is what we call the triumphant entry. He sent them out to get a donkey. He said, you go tell the guy that I want to borrow it. I had one guy say one time that uh, he wouldn't have anything to do with a donkey thief or a horse thief. Jesus didn't steal that donkey. He owned it all. That was the master of all the universe and the owner of all the universe. He borrowed it. He borrowed it for a while. And you know what? He said, they're going to go up. They asked you why you're taking him. You just say, the master has need it. The Kyrios. Kyrios means what? The Lord. In the Old Testament, they translated the word Adonai. And they also translated the word Jehovah as the Lord, God Almighty, has needed him. And of course, God prepared their heart, and they is And it means King of Kings, doesn't it? It means King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, how the night is. All right. When he told him that the Lord, Kyrios, I did not pronounce that correctly, brother. Yes. <laughs> also, the new uh, new language today. Uh -huh. The key is also a serve. Sir. What? Serve. 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 Sir. 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 Oh, serve. Okay, Kidios. 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 All right. That Ypsilon is a Y sound, not a U sound. The Germans, when they wrote the Greek grammars, so many of them brought German into the Greek, and they call it Kyrios, not Kyrios. <coughs> but Kyrios is the correct pronunciation. They put you have to have a Greek here tonight, brother. I appreciate that. <laughs> Would they put the umlaut over it? What? Would the Germans put the umlaut over it? Well, see, yeah, the Germans go like this. Yeah. All right? But this is Kyrios. It is a... The Ypsilon, which they call the Upsilon, is not a Upsilon, but an Ypsilon. And it is a Y sound, not the U sound. If it's used as a diphthong, epsilon, epsilon, then it becomes a U sound. <coughs> Ooh, all right. Eurisco, whatever. Then it becomes sound like, and because it did that, they got confused. By the way, the Germans are some of the greatest grammarians and, and language writers in the world, but they've messed up Greek. It's not like the Germans. <laughs> all right. So we straighten it out. Because by the agents of him, we have. Look at this word, we have. It comes from echo. Oisei omenete usiane. This is present indicative active. All right? Oisei omenete usiane. O, A, S, A. I, U, she, he, or it. We, ye, and they are to have. Okay. Echo. Echoman here. That's first person plural, present indicative active. We have. We have the pain. That's accusing singular feminine, by the way. Pros agoge. Here's what the word synagogue comes from also. See this word ago there in the middle of it? And that means I go. But it means to go forward. And some in some ways, of course it's pro copto, and that in some ways it means to blaze the trail. We have the access, we have the admission, we have the approach. Cross I'll go game. It means more than that. <clears throat> we have access publicly in plain open view. The ones both 
You don't have to hide to come to Jesus now. If you're a Gentile, you don't have to become a Jew to become to get close to God. At one time, they had to become a proselyte. They had to denounce their background to become a Jew. They had to denounce their background. When they were baptized, they had to get up and denounce, I was a Greek. I'm no longer Greek, but now I'm a spiritual Hebrew. You don't have to do that anymore. We are all one in Christ. We are, there is no boundaries, no ethnic backgrounds. Ethnic backgrounds mean nothing. Nothing. We have open public access. The ones both, the ones as Hoy, on Old Cattery, in Heaney, in, little preposition, just like a word in, in one pneumatic. What kind of a word in English comes from this pneumatic? What? What? Pneumatics. What is pneumatics? Something that is powered by air. All right. We have the word pneumatology. Pneumatology means the study of spirits. All right. Pneumatics. Air brakes. Air tubes. All that. That's all pneumatics. In spirit, in one spirit. What is the Hebrew word for spirit, by the way? Ruach. 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 Same word. Breath, wind, spirit. All right? Spirit. In one spirit, prostone patera. Toward the patera. Who's the patera? Father. All right. Before Christ, no man was ever given the privilege of speaking to God as Father. you never find that in the Old Testament. The Father, they never could speak to God as Father. Never before Jesus was man ever to address God as Father. But only as Adonai. And only as the Holy God. But when Jesus came into this world, he taught his disciples to pray. Father. Father. We can call him our Holy Father. He is our Father. If we're born again. If you've tasted of the free grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ, you can call God Father. And we have access to him. Psalm 23. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Now we can say, Jesus is our shepherd. In John 10's chapter, what is it? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. We know who that shepherd was. In the Old Testament it says, the Lord, Jehovah, is my shepherd. In the New Testament, Jehovah, Jesus, is our shepherd. And he gives us access right directly to the throne of God. Because we can say Daddy. We can say Father. Jesus on the cross of Calvary, he said what? Abba, Father. Abba, Father. We can answer. We can be that intimate. Yes, we are. He is our daddy. Before, before we come to God, our daddy is not that beautiful throne of God, but it is the master of this world, what we call the spirit of this beings, the evil one, where we have one or two fathers. Either God, if we know God, or the evil one that hooks us and hoodwinks us and blinds us, and we live in darkness, and we still think we're in life, but we live in broken darkness, as he's said here in Ephesians. And we're going to see that all a little bit further. Thank you for your attention today. I hope you learned something from the Word of God. Chris, Chris Stoss, it's good to have you here. I hope that you enjoyed your language. <laughs> <laughs> it me back uh, my youth. <laughs> well, you come back again. Good to have you in here. It's good to have. Uh, I teach them things, and sometimes it's good to have Greek. Uh, uh, we have. I've had several Greek scholars and uh, Greek people come to my class in the past. I had one guy that he was born in Athens. He was educated in Athens. He went to New York. He was went to the University of California in Los Angeles. And he took Greek in all those places. 
He came and sat in my classes two or three times. He said, jumping them down. He said, you ought to be teaching in New York City. <laughs> because he said, these people there are nothing but imposters. <laughs> he said, they do not know the tenses and the language and the history like you do. He said, boy, he said, I'd enjoy the class. He really enjoyed the class. It was really good to, to see that. I, I, I have a lot of good Greek friends, or good friends that are Greeks, that really enjoy the that and we'll talk with, about the language so, so much. And it is a beautiful language. It's a historic language. It's a language that is just so... Our language, the English language, came a lot of it came from Greek. All the medical language came from Greek. Of course, Latin came from Greek. Even when the Romans were in power, they printed their coins in what? In Greek, not in Latin. <laughs> the legal language was still Greek. All right. Alexander the Great had such an influence on the whole world that for 600, 700 years, the whole world's language, one world language was Greek. It was Greek. Everybody, all the commerce and everything was in that language. Thank you for your attention tonight and the endurance on those hard seats for a whole hour. And... Uh, Brother Harry, would you dismiss us in prayer, please, brother? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just come and say thank you once again for all that we have we had the <clears throat> chance to learn tonight, Father. And we just thank you for Brother Jim, Father, for just using him as your vehicle to teach your lesson, Father. And we just pray that you touch his body, Father, and and, and you, you know his needs, Father. Whatever the doctor can't do, you just take over for we know that you are the master. And Father, we just pray that you continue just to bless us. And as we go out today, we want to just say thank you and, and just have you in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, brother.